Good, ev good evening, everyone. We will be starting um, tonight's program in just a minute. Good evening, everybody. My name is John Mogul. Um, I'm Associate Director at the Wolfsonian Florida International University. And I wanna thank you all for joining us and welcome everyone to Art Deco Weekend 2021. For those of you that don't know us, oops, I accidentally muted my video. For those of you that don't, that don't know the Wolfsonian, um, we are a museum of art and design located in Miami Beach. Um, in fact, we're located just a couple of blocks down 10th Street from the Miami Design Preservation League, or MDPL, which of course organizes Art Deco Weekend every year. This year, of course, things are a little bit different. Ordinarily, the streets of the Art Deco District in South Beach, the neighborhood that the Wolfsonian and MDPL share is filled with tens of thousands of visitors who come to enjoy the Art Deco weekend events, especially the street fair that MD, MDPL organizes on Ocean Avenue. Uh, as I said, this year, things are different. Our streets are pretty quiet and there's no fair this year. But there's more to Art Deco weekend than the street fair. Every year, the Wolfsonian and MDPL cooperate to offer a series of talks and other events that take place at the museum. You can't really have a virtual street fair, or at least I don't know how you could have one. But as we've all discovered, I think, you can do plenty of other things virtually. And we're excited that we get to partner with MDPL again this year to offer a suite of virtual Art Deco weekend programs. And this is the first one. I'm sharing a screen right now that lists the other events that the Wolfsonian will be offering this weekend. On Saturday afternoon at 4 p.m., you can get a virtual tour of the Saarinen House, a masterpiece designed by the Finnish architect Elil Saarinen on the campus of the Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan, right outside of Detroit. Your virtual guide will be Kevin Adkison, Associate Curator at Cranbrook. If you like house tours and Detroit seems a little cold at this time of year, you'll have an opportunity on Sunday at 4 p.m. when we'll feature a live tour of Hollyhock House in Los Angeles, designed by Frank Lloyd Wright for the heiress and art patron Aline Barnsdall. Your guide on Sunday will be Hollyhock House curator, Abby Chamberlain. If you'd like to register for either of these programs, you can do so by visiting our website, wolfsonian.org and clicking on the what's on link on the homepage. Besides the two programs the Wolfsonian is offering, MDPL itself We'll be hosting a number of other outstanding events, and you can find a calendar of those events at the artdecoweekend.com link that you see here, and you'll be hearing a little bit more about them in just a minute. The theme for this year's events, as you can probably already see, is Art Deco in the Domestic Sphere. We're going to kick things off tonight by taking a look at how that theme is reflected in the Wolfsonian's collection. But before I introduce our speaker for the evening, let me first turn it over to the chair of the Miami Design Preservation League's board, Mr. Jack Johnson, who's going to offer some words of welcome himself. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Jack Johnson. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to the 44th annual Art Deco Weekend and the first 
ever virtual Art Deco weekend. Uh, because we're all stuck at home these days, our theme this year is there's no place like home. Um, and we have a, 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 an extensive program for you over the next three days. Um, the program will include six lectures, two Deco speakeasies. If you haven't been to one of our Deco speakeasies as yet, I highly recommend them. They're a lot of fun. And two dance classes. Uh, so there's a lot to do this weekend, and we'll keep you busy for the whole weekend. Um, as John said, uh, you can see the entire schedule at uh, artdecoweekend.com. Um, and I'd just like to mention before I uh, go on with my comments that uh, MDPL will be hosting the World Congress on Art Deco in 2023. So keep in touch with us uh, as uh, details on that event um, are planned in the future. There's a lot of people to thank for this Art Deco weekend, beginning with the Waltonian FIU. We always um, uh, partner with them for Art Deco weekend, uh, but this year uh, we wouldn't have been able to put it together without their assistance. Uh, and our sponsors, uh, the City of Miami Beach, the original Miami Beach Antique Show, the Florida Division of Cultural Affairs, Miami-Dade County, uh, our media sponsors, Atlantic Broadband, the Miami Herald, the New Times, WLRN, and our marketing sponsor, um, the Greater Miami Convention and Visitors Bureau. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, the board of the Miami Design Preservation League, our executive director, Daniel Seraldo, and his staff who have um, demonstrated a great deal of creativity to put this together. Our tour guides, our volunteers, and our members. And if you're not a member of, of uh, MDPL, you should be. Uh, you can correct that by going to mdpl.org. Uh, and uh, you'll easily find there um, a way to become a member of the Miami Design Preservation League. So I encourage you to do so and enjoy our DECA weekend. Back to you, John. Thank you, Jack, and, and many thanks from the Wolfsonian to MDPL, to you and to Daniel and to all of our colleagues. Um, I'm looking at the chat right now and I'm seeing a spectacular range of greetings from all over the world. I just saw one from Hungary, but I think the champion goes to the person joining us from Christchurch, New Zealand, where it's either tomorrow or yesterday, I'm not sure which, um, but uh, thank you um, for joining us from near and far. Um, it's my great pleasure right now to introduce the speaker for this evening, my colleague and the Wolfsonian's chief curator, Silvia Baricione. During her tenure at the Wolfsonian, Silvia has curated many exhibitions, including The Rebirth of Rome, Modern Dutch Design, and made in, made in Italy, Mita Textile Design, 1926 to 1976. Most relevant for this evening, Sylvia was also co-curator of our own exhibition about Art Deco design and decorative arts called Deco, Luxury to Mass Market. Before coming to the Wolfsonian, Sylvia was a founding curator at the Wolfsoniana the Wolfsonian Sister Museum in Genoa, Italy. And you'll get at least a peek at the Wolfsoniana collection um, in her presentation this evening. In addition to her curatorial work, she's a widely published writer on 20th century design and material culture. And she has been recognized as a Knight of the Order of the Star of Italy, an honor bestowed by the Italian government on expatriates who have been outstanding in their work promoting Italian culture and elevating national prestige abroad. 
Uh, Sylvia will speak to us tonight about modern for the masses, how Art Deco designed to find a new way of living in the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, but first, I also wanna let you know that if you have a question for Sylvia, please use the Q&A button, which should be at the bottom of your screen. And um, Sylvia will take as many questions as we have time for this evening. And of course, keep checking in, saying hi, letting us know where you're from um, using the chat button. Um, um, so Sylvia, over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you, John, for the presentation. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, okay. <clears throat> uh, so good evening uh, to uh, everybody and um, uh, John has already introduced uh, uh, my presentation so I just uh, would like to um, to say that uh, I'm going to talk uh, um, about modern for the masses but uh, I will uh, focus in especially on um, two countries Italy and then the United States uh, because I would like also to highlight uh, some of the pieces uh, which uh, are in the collection of the Wilsoniana in Genoa, our uh, sister institution that also our uh, uh, members uh, don't, are not so familiar with these uh, objects. Um, <clears throat> and naturally talking about uh, Art Deco, we have to start uh, from uh, Paris 1925, uh, uh, the famous Exposition Internationale des Arts Décoratifs et Industrielles Modernes, which gave the name to uh, the style. We started to, to, uh, to call it Art Deco in the 1960s. Um, the, the poster that I'm showing here is a, a design drawing in the collection of the Wilsonian. And uh, it was not then printed and used, and used for the exhibition, but uh, uh, it really ex um, exemplifies the characters and uh, uh, the motifs of Art Deco, uh, like bright colors, uh, symmetry, uh, geometry, stylized uh, uh, na natural motifs, and um, also an uh, interest for uh, 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 the exotic uh, countries, uh, for. Uh, um, for example, a, a, an interest in uh, African architecture and art, which was uh, uh, typical of uh, France of the period, recognizing uh, the culture of their uh, colonies. And in fact, you have uh, this uh, nude uh, figure and in the background, uh, um, the architecture of uh, a fantastic representation of architecture of Northern Africa. Uh, on the other side, on the left, uh, on the right, uh, you have the medal, which was uh, the official medal of the, uh, of the show. Uh, again, uh, showing this uh, stylization, this uh, sophisticated uh, nude woman and uh, this uh, abundance of uh, flowers. Uh, the exhibition was opened in uh, spring and was uh, um, a, really a, a way to uh, celebrate uh, the primacy of uh, France uh, in, uh, in, um, in decoration, architecture, art, uh, and, um, and industry. Uh, the, um, in fact, uh, the, the two of the posters that were selected for the exhibition, there was a competition and uh, um, the first one, Roberto Rocan didn't uh, pass, but in 25, uh, uh, four posters were, uh, were chosen. And in the collection, we have these two. Uh, I think it's very interesting, uh, the one on the left by Charles Lupo, because it shows again uh, a, another feature of Art Deco, which is the uh, stylized flower, and in particular the rose. Uh, while in the Art Nouveau, we usually have the lily or the um, uh, iris, in uh, uh, Art Deco, uh, the mo most usual flower is the rose. And, um, and then uh, the, the contrast with the industries, because uh, uh, what we have to uh, consider in Art Deco, that uh, the objects, it was uh, the, um, uh, the creation of uh, modern objects, which were both individually crafted and so uh, more luxury items, but also mass produced wares. Uh, like for example, uh, these two objects, uh, um, which were retailed by Robbie, 
um, they were they they were not so precious. You could find them; they were not uh, uh, unique pieces, and you could find them also in the, in the department stores, which were like the the main um, uh, the, the the main uh, way to develop uh, this style for the masses uh, at the time was the department store. And you can see again in these two uh, objects. Uh, uh, the, the motif of the stylized flower, symmetry, the uh, naked uh, figure, and uh, the uh, very bright uh, colors. Uh, in, uh, at the exhibition, uh, there were, uh, besides the, um, the national pavilions, uh, there were uh, the, uh, the pavilions of the main uh, department stores uh, in Paris. The Pavilion de Printemps was particularly interesting uh, because in the shape uh, it looked uh, at the um, uh, touched hearts uh, or, uh, or in Africa, and um, and the architect was Henri Sauvage, a, a very uh, like one of the um, main architects uh, of the period. Uh, another uh, very interesting uh, uh, pavilion which uh, one, uh, showed uh, like the. Uh, the primacy of uh, Ita uh, of uh, French uh, uh, decoration and uh, interiors uh, were the Ambassade Francaise, uh, where there were uh, many suites uh, designed by several uh, uh, French designers that showed uh, again a more uh, uh, luxury side and the interest in craftsmanship, like for example, this uh, Petit Salon by uh, Maurice Dufresne that looks uh, at the past, uh, look, uh, looks is a kind of a reinterpretation of the uh, French uh, uh, 18th century furniture. Or uh, this more uh, uh, geometric uh, that shows the typical angularity of uh, um, Art Deco in this uh, um, uh, room for a, a young girl designed by Re uh, René Gabriel, who was uh, uh, more interested in uh, mass-produced uh, furniture. The same was for uh, Francis Jordan, who uh, was interested to create uh, uh, furniture even for the working class. And, um, uh, and for example, this was a, a, um, a fumoir that he designed used the, using uh, just paneling and uh, modular, uh, uh, modular uh, pieces uh, to create uh, this interior. And uh, he also collaborated with uh, uh, Rob Mallet Stevens, who was uh, probably among these uh, the most important also uh, an architect. He designed uh, the pa uh, pavilion uh, of uh, tourism for the same exhibition. And you can see this interior, uh, it's much more uh, geometric and uh, uh, less uh, uh, let's say decorative uh, compared to other uh, uh, French uh, designers of the of the period. <clears throat> so uh, several uh, several uh, uh, nations participated, uh, but uh, um, a Germany was not invited. The United States uh, uh, states were not invited. Uh, but they didn't want to participate because they thought that their uh, decorative arts at the period were not uh, modern enough. Uh, so I will show you uh, the Austrian pavilion because, uh, well, the, the architecture is very interesting. Uh, this, uh, it was made out of concrete and, uh, rep and presents these uh, uh, like uh, bold horizontally uh, molded walls. Uh, which is it, an element that we return in other, uh, um, also in, uh, in other Art Deco objects. And um, uh, Josef Hoffman had created, founded in 1903, uh, the Wiener Werkstatt together with the Kolo Moser. And uh, so in Art Deco, we can see uh, the influence from uh, the Wiener Werkstatt, they were very uh, stylized, very geometric uh, already in the early teens. Uh, for example, uh, this uh, textile by Carlotto Czeska uh, reminds uh, in a way uh, the frozen fountain, which uh, will be a typical element of Art Deco. And uh, also these uh, two vases, uh, one by Hilda uh, Yeser from 1921, uh, shows uh, this uh, pointy, this angularity uh, typical of uh, Art Deco. 
and uh, the, the fluted uh, um, surface of the vase by Hoffman also uh, are uh, like uh, foresee uh, Art Deco. Because we talk about Art Deco starting from 1925 uh, uh, when it's celebrated in Paris, but actually it was uh, starting uh, before. And uh, <clears throat> the last pavilion, national pavilion, I would like to show you is the, uh, uh, the one from the Netherlands. Uh, it was very interesting because uh, uh, he looked, uh, the, the architect was uh, Fre uh, Friedrich Stahl, uh, created this um, uh, building in a brick, uh, typical uh, material used in the Netherlands, uh, and uh, uh, the, the style that uh, we usually uh, we used for, for this kind of a pavilion is the Amsterdam school style. So an architecture that looked in a way to a German expressionism, but also uh, to the architecture of uh, Indonesia, which was one of uh, the uh, Dutch colonies at, at the time. And uh, the same uh, can be seen in the, in, uh, the furniture uh, of the, um, uh, which was inside the pavilion designed by Michel de Klerk. Uh, this furniture is uh, also in the, the Wilsonian collection, de Klerk, uh, uh, was uh, um, died very young, but uh, he was celebrated uh, in uh, this uh, pavilion with his uh, uh, living room that again uh, presents uh, um, features from uh, um, Indonesian uh, culture. For example, you, you can look uh, at the armrests. They have two uh, ashtrays uh, that uh, uh, refer to the monsters that you can uh, see in uh, Indonesian uh, temples. And uh, uh, this uh, um, vase was uh, a model uh, displayed inside the pavilion uh, by Colin Brander. Again, uh, the shape uh, reminds of uh, more uh, uh, like Indonesian uh, temples. Uh, and the pattern is very interesting because uh, it's, uh, it's very geometric and it was a, a, a pattern which was uh, used by Dutch uh, designers who were always very um, geometric and uh, bidimensional in their uh, decorations. And again, the, the, the colors, the, the bright colors are typically deco anyway, even if they have this uh, kind of uh, more uh, uh, particular, uh, particular uh, exotic uh, um, flavor. And uh, finally, um, I would like to show you a vase by Yak, uh, Yap, Yap Gidding made for Landa, Led, Lerdam, which was the main uh, glass uh, company uh, active in those years in the Netherlands. And you can see uh, again the, the decoration, it's a, a stylized nature, and this uh, stylized rose is uh, typical of uh, Art Deco. Um, Italy was uh, present at the uh, French uh, uh, exhibition in Paris. Uh, but the, the pavilion was very classicist, not at all modernist. So I didn't want to show it to you. Uh, and uh, I would, uh, I prefer to go directly to Italy in Monza, where uh, in the same year, the uh, international uh, exhibition of decorative arts uh, opened. Uh, so in Italy, uh, again, there was a strong tradition of craftsmanship, uh, but uh, the, the styles uh, were, uh, uh, very, uh, let's say, the, the objects uh, that were created with such a skill, uh, skillful uh, uh, um, craftsmanship were all uh, uh, very um, eclectic. So in the 1920s, a, a biennial exhibition was founded to uh, promote a new design. And uh, so in a, a comparison with other countries, uh, uh, the um, Italian decorative arts uh, would have been uh, uh, in a way modernized. Uh, the, the poster is a beautiful example of uh, Art Deco with elements which are typical that return, uh, often return from the cornucopia, uh, to, which is a, an element that comes from a classical uh, uh, language, to the gazelle, like the exotic uh, um, the exotic animal, uh, which uh, will become uh, one of the main uh, um, 
the main animals uh, in uh, in uh, the um, deco iconography. And we have two examples here from uh, this urn that looks at uh, classical urn, uh, ca at classical uh, urns like the Italian classical heritage, with this figure of a um, of a gazelle that we we can find also in a tea site uh, in a silver tea site uh, from uh, Bombay. Uh, in the Wilsonian collection, where the, um, the lines are more, much more modern and uh, the, um, the figure of the uh, gazelle is much more uh, stylized. Uh, on, uh, <clears throat> in uh, Monza in uh, 1923, uh, the, um, there were uh, several uh, states uh, um, represented and Italy was also represented uh, through its uh, regions. Uh, so at the time, uh, um, there was still a very uh, big interest in uh, the regional uh, traditions. And uh, for example, uh, here you have uh, the um, Veneto section, so the, the region of Venice, uh, presenting a room uh, by Vittorio Zecchin where we, we can feel the influence of Gustav Klimt, uh, like Austria was uh, uh, like dominated uh, uh, Veneto at the time, and uh, and also uh, the Byzantine mosaics in these uh, golden, uh, in these uh, gilded uh, inlays uh, in um, in this uh, um, cabinet, uh, and uh, in the in the Roman section we have this piece by Duilio Cambellotti, an artist from Rome. Uh, and this, this piece is considered one of the uh, masterpieces of Italian Art Deco. In fact, uh, in uh, the publication uh, that uh, the big uh, uh, Encyclopédie des Arts Décoratives, which was published in Paris in 1925, uh, this was included. And uh, it's uh, an adaptation of the, um, let's say, peasant uh, uh, sturdy furniture. Um, so it's a simple uh, parallel uh, parallelepiped, but uh, uh, the um, like the elements of these uh, caryatids that represent uh, the um, Roman peasants uh, and uh, these uh, floating uh, ships uh, uh, inlaid in um, um, in uh, ebony and uh, ivory uh, add uh, such a precious uh, uh, character uh, to to the piece. Uh, that is really considered uh, one of the uh, masterpieces, uh, Italian masterpieces of the time. And uh, you can see the, uh, the representation, uh, you can see it on, uh, on the right uh, in, uh, um, in the display in Monza. Uh, so the, the displays were uh, really very, uh, again, uh, decor uh, decorative rooms with the many uh, interventions of um, artists and decorators. In the same uh, exhibition, uh, uh, there was um, Widen Drovitz, uh, an artist and uh, um, architect and ceramist from Trieste, uh, presented uh, this vase. It's very interesting, again, looking at this vase and seeing the influence uh, on Art Deco of the Wiener Werkstatt. Uh, on, the on the right, uh, you have a photograph from, 1920, uh, from 1918, of a um, fabric store of the Wiener Werkstatt in uh, Vienna. And you can see the same use of uh, uh, like looking at the Rococo past uh, and uh, with this uh, as a kind of reinterpretation of the Roco Rococo past uh, in, uh, on the walls and you can see it on the um, surface of the uh, ceramic vase. Uh, the same, uh, and Lovitz uh, um, adopted uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, vernacular uh, um, representations in this, uh, t uh, in this set, which was called uh, uh, Monza, because it was presented in Monza, uh, uh, or uh, Margherita, because of the shape of the, uh, like a daisy of the, um, of the set. Uh, but it's interesting to see how from the 1920s to the 1930s, uh, 
uh, in Italy, also in Italy, and not just in the United States, like the, the shapes uh, were uh, became much more, uh, much uh, smoother uh, with the, these uh, more uh, linear uh, elements. And so uh, these, uh, these influence uh, of uh, modernist influence came for sure also from the Bauhaus. Uh, but uh, in uh, 1933, at the same, um, uh, when uh, the Biennale moved uh, to Milan um, in the, and became a triennial, uh, Guillaume Doblitz uh, presented uh, this kind of uh, uh, set, uh, much more modern. <clears throat> and, um, and at the same uh, triennial in 1933, uh, the, um, uh, these, uh, let's say decorative ob object uh, was uh, presented uh, by Giovanni Gariboldi, uh, who was the rival of Gio Ponti in, uh, the, in the company Richard Dinori. Uh, this, this is a very interesting uh, piece uh, because uh, it represents uh, the dolphins. Uh, and uh, this, uh, again, uh, the, um, the stylized water uh, reminds uh, uh, very much to the frozen fountain, uh, one of the deco elements that, that we can see all over, uh, uh, for example, in, in uh, the architecture of uh, Miami Beach. And this motif of the dolphins uh, is used uh, like uh, as a handle in this uh, tray by Arrigo Finzi, a silver tray, a, center pre a centerpiece uh, showing, um, again, like the refined uh, uh, solution for uh, this kind of uh, uh, decorative pieces that were not uh, mass produced at all. And uh, again, like a, a version of the uh, frozen fountain can be seen in this uh, wrought iron, uh, wrought iron uh, uh, fountain with birds by Carlo Rizzarda. Uh, another uh, um, wrought iron uh, um, artist who became very popular at the time he, he worked a lot in, uh, in um, Amer uh, Latin America. And, um, and so this is a kind of uh, interpretation, uh, Italian interpretation of the frozen fountain that we, we see much more stylized in, uh, in, the, um, in uh, the architecture of uh, Miami Beach or uh, New York. And uh, the, the motif becomes, uh, again, a decorative motif also uh, on a poster celebrating uh, the um, exp uh, Exposition Internationale in uh, Barcelona. Uh, so we, we always uh, uh, talk about uh, the Paris exhibition, but actually in uh, uh, 1929, there was an important international uh, exhibition also in Barcelona that presented uh, the evolution of Art Deco. And um, from, uh, uh, from that period, uh, we have uh, this uh, coffee service uh, uh, designed by Jaime um, uh, Mercade, which was recently donated uh, uh, by uh, our board member Sandy Seligman to Mickey Watson for his uh, birthday. Uh, so we were very happy because it's uh, like the first uh, uh, very interesting piece of uh, Spanish Art Deco that we have in the collection. And um, uh, Mercade um, got the, uh, won the gold medal at the uh, exposition in Barcelona and uh, the silver one in Paris. And you can see in this uh, object, which is like, this is in uh, silver with the uh, oak um, handles, uh, like a kind of a Baroque uh, uh, reinterpretation of uh, Art Deco. Um, <clears throat> so besides the international exhibitions uh, in Italy, the um, the, most the main promoter of modern uh, uh, design and architecture were, uh, were the magazines. One was Domus, uh, directed by Gio Ponti, and the other one was Casabella. Uh, Domus, for example, uh, this is a, a cover from 1930 presenting uh, this uh, vase from the collection, which was also displayed in um, at the Trennale, uh, which sh shows uh, Again, uh, like the um, first, uh, the uh, multidisciplinarity of Gio Ponti, who was uh, a, the editor and founder of a magazine, was an architect, but also designed the artistic director for uh, Richard Ginori. 
and, uh, and also designed the furniture. And uh, uh, he, he also was a great promoter of the arts uh, and, uh, uh, and the architecture in Italy. And for example, uh, he, he pointed out uh, uh, many of the interiors designed by his colleagues. Uh, for example, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Casa Chirini in uh, Trieste designed by, um, by the Tri uh, Trieste architect, architect uh, um, um, Gustavo Pulitzer. Uh, you uh, look, uh, uh, look at the boudoir in the, in the middle, uh, the, the boudoir cabinet in the middle of the room, and you can see it uh, in um, the, uh, the, the actual one, which is uh, um, in the Wilsonian collection in Miami. Uh, it's a very interesting piece, uh, again, uh, showing uh, a, um, the Italian variant of uh, Art Deco, where uh, uh, the use of the inlays, which is a tra very traditional uh, um, uh, technique, uh, represents uh, the, the birth of uh, Rome. Again, a classical, uh, uh, a classical theme. Uh, but we can see, again, uh, connections uh, with the Wiener Werkstatt. In this uh, cabinet, uh, mm, which was a bit uh, um, designed uh, for years before uh, by Josef Hoffman and Maria Lickards. So it's very interesting to see how um, Gustavo Pulitzer was uh, uh, like uh, raised in Trieste and also educated uh, with the Nostran influence, how he was uh, uh, like uh, um, close uh, to the Wiener Werkstatt. And uh, <clears throat> again, as I said, Gio Ponti was also a furniture designer uh, in this case, uh, again, he, he looks at the um, more uh, traditional, uh, uh, like the neoclassical uh, tradition of uh, um, Milan, Milan in architecture and, uh, and furniture. In fact, he was uh, based in Milan. And, uh, and in this case, uh, um, this piece uh, was a piece designed uh, custom made for uh, a for a family, the Scaiola family. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is that this kind of furniture designed by Gioponti was also created for a, a more uh, like a mass produced, uh, um, um, mass produced uh, um, furniture in, um, for the uh, Rinascente, which was the main uh, department store uh, in uh, Milan at the time. And uh, <clears throat> since he was the uh, artistic director for uh, um, uh, Richard Ginori for at least 10 years, uh, he created the most uh, incredible uh, uh, shapes and uh, also using uh, colors, uh, uh, like the bright colors that were uh, used by the co-designers. And uh, so we have this uh, uh, set called the Barbara set from 1930 which shows really like the modernity of uh, Gio Ponti and uh, like they refined the contrast between uh, uh, the gold and this uh, blue, br uh, brilliant blue. Uh, <clears throat> but as I was mentioning uh, before, uh, uh, yes, in 1933, the Biennale, which was uh, uh, founded in Monza, moved uh, to uh, Milan and uh, became uh, uh, like the platform for uh, modern architecture and modern uh, design. Uh, the a new building was erected in 1933, um, like, um, which uh, uh, reflects uh, the Novecento uh, style. Uh, so you can look at the architecture, it's modern, but uh, it's a kind of modern interpretation of classical uh, uh, architecture with the use of arches, uh, um, but it's very, like, in a way, uh, streamlined. And um, <clears throat> in 1933, uh, there was a very interesting exhibition that looked at the um, Werkbund uh, Ausstellung that was held in uh, Stuttgart in 1927. So the Werkbund Siedlung, uh, a group of uh, um, houses designed by different uh, um, modernist architects. In, um, in Milan, uh, there was uh, um, around 30 house models designed by Italian architects. And uh, we can see that uh, the modern, uh, more uh, functionalist uh, uh, style uh, prevailed. 
this was, for example, uh, a, a, a steel structure house, like a module of house uh, that could be like a, um, at which at which you could uh, you, uh, add more floors. And this was very modernist for Italy, where there were no high rises at the time. And uh, all, uh, all these house models uh, were naturally fur furnished. And uh, this uh, chair, which was designed uh, by Luigi Vietti and which is in the Genoa collection, is very interesting because uh, if you look at it, you think of uh, the furniture of uh, the birch uh, bent furniture of Alvar Alto. But uh, uh, Luigi Vietti wanted to uh, point out uh, the layered uh, um, surface of the wood. And so he created this kind of motif of a, a like a um, stepped motif on the arms and uh, the legs of the chair. And uh, <clears throat> uh, in, uh, in Italy, even uh, uh, tubular furniture, looking at the Bauhaus models, uh, started to be produced in the middle of the 1930s, also creating uh, uh, very particular shapes uh, like this model uh, uh, number five by Gra Gabriele Mucchi, which was uh, a stacking chair and could be produced uh, with uh, different uh, materials. The seat could have uh, uh, very different uh, materials. Um, so we have to consider that in Italy there were uh, um, like uh, three main tendencies, one trends. Uh, one was uh, like the Novecento, which was more a uh, classicist. Uh, one was the rationalism, which was more like functionalist, uh, looking at the um, like what we define modernist, and that uh, we was later defined uh, uh, international style was like the Italian variant of international style. And then there was uh, well, uh, futurism was uh, still alive in the 1930s, and actually. Uh, Futurist uh, um, created a, man a manifesto for uh, the ceramics uh, in 1938 and they started to produce uh, um, ceramic uh, uh, objects uh, already in the uh, late 1920s. Uh, you can see here the design uh, by Nikolai Dulgarov, who was originally for Bulgaria. Uh, created, uh, he created these uh, objects uh, thinking of mass production. Uh, but using very particular uh, shapes uh, and um, using this uh, airbrush uh, technique, uh, which was uh, typical of uh, futurist uh, ceramics uh, in those years. Uh, <clears throat> and so, as I told you, there was a, a trend which was more uh, novecento, more uh, like looking at the classical uh, uh, legacy of Italy. And also um, the production was, uh, let's say, uh, usually more uh, custom made, like in this case, it was a design room for uh, um, the Ancelotti residence in Florence. It's very interesting how they, the couple, they were very fond of uh, sports, so they were represented uh, here as a um, football, football player, like a soccer player, and she as a, uh, in a, with a ski outfit. Uh, so this reflects also the, the cult for the body and for sport, which was typical of, uh, uh, of Italy in the years of the regime. Uh, because you have also to consider that uh, in, uh, in Italy in the 1920s and the 30s, uh, there was uh, like Mussolini's regime. And uh, <clears throat> he, in a way, he was uh, tolerant towards uh, uh, like uh, any kind of... Uh, um, let's say architectural uh, and design trend. Uh, the important was that it was uh, that it celebrated Italy. So um, in the beginning, it's, uh, especially it was more uh, like modernist. It was supported by the futurists, and uh, so he became more uh, when uh, the, the uh, empire uh, um, was declared. Uh, like after 1935, uh, um, he became more uh, classicist also. In, uh, in the architecture that uh, he built in those years. Uh, but before he was more modernist. Uh, anyway, um, this is a very interesting example of uh, Italian design during a regime. It's called the uh, uh, table, uh, Lautarca, which uh, means uh, like autarky, relying on, um, on uh, your uh, like on uh, self, uh, like self economy. And uh, it was designed by a notary for uh, 
for himself was also had a copyright but was never uh, uh, then mass produced probably because it was too uh, expensive to to produce but it was the idea of a table that uh, uh, would have all the um, the possibilities uh, for uh, having uh, a complete lunch without uh, having any anybody serving you and uh, it was so uh, the the table is now in uh, the collection of the Bolsoniana in Jena with the complete set like Richard Ginori uh, porcelain uh, um, plates uh, original ones the uh, in red the the, the glasses are uh, uh, made in Murano, and um, uh, so you you just uh, can turn the the, um, the the table, and you have a uh, you have a handle, and uh, you can have all the different uh, um, like from the uh, from the um, uh, from the and uh, well up to the dessert and. Uh, and so it, it was like this idea of having something that uh, um, during a regime you could be uh, with your guests without having anybody uh, like your servants listening to you while uh, you were talking. And uh, in uh, in the same <clears throat> in the same years, uh, also some materials were favored uh, compared to others. And for example. Uh, um, glass, uh, like or a uh, securit, which was a tempered uh, uh, glass, uh, was uh, um, repl replaced uh, uh, iron at the time because uh, iron was used for uh, like uh, um, naturally for uh, gun production, and so um, um, glass was uh, used for uh, balustrades. Like in this case, uh, in this. Uh, um, a liquidal uh, staircase in um, in the in uh, Casa Bedarida in Livorno, designed by Piero Bottoni. Piero Bottoni was a Milanese uh, rationalist architect who created this uh, interior in 1937. And uh, the um, uh, the table, which is an ellip elliptic uh, uh, shape, um, with this uh, motif of the horizontal uh, line in the chairs and in the in the like uh, lower part of the table um, is now in the collection is on display in the at the Wilsoniana in uh, Genoa, and uh, uh, Bottoni was a very interesting uh, architect. He he was interested in uh, mass production and um, he designed, for example, uh, radio this uh, radio audiola for the uh, CGE, which was a subsidiary of the. Um, um, an Italian uh, sub subsidiary of um, of the American uh, company, and uh, it's uh, like the shape is very um, like uh, there is a um, very geometric shape with these uh, rounded edges, uh, uh, like typical of the 1930s. Uh, if we compare it to the uh, American radios, uh, this is much more, uh, uh, let's say. Uh, it's very clean, and um, and then the use of wood, which is uh, uh, which is not so typical um, in uh, in the American uh, uh, radios of the same period. But if you close the uh, the sliding doors, uh, you will see that it's uh, he used the celluloid. So he also used one of the new plastics of those years, and. Um, and as you can see, uh, even in um, in those years, uh, the um, uh, starting from the 1930s, there is a, a fascination for uh, uh, the machine, uh, the machine um, aesthetics, uh, starting from uh, uh, from the lamps, uh, the um, like uh, uh, you have uh, this uh, shape which is repeated. Uh, uh, for example, also in these British lamps, uh, um, which were, uh, uh, we never could uh, uh, find out the designer, probably was the Hinaus designer of a British electric uh, transformer, uh, but uh, uh, we found them published again in Domus uh, uh, in, uh, in a, a mansion designed by the architect uh, 
uh, Raymond McGrath, uh, and um, they were in, um, in, in copper and uh, uh, reading the description. You can see that these uh, sliding doors were uh, in uh, copper too. And uh, <coughs> the, the shape, uh, but upside down, can be found also in this uh, lamp uh, um, by uh, Sarin and, and Walter Van Nessen, Van Nessen, uh, von Nessen uh, that uh, um, introduced uh, the um, American side of, um, of the collection uh, of the Wilsonian here in Miami. Uh, so uh, Sarinen and uh, von Nessen were both uh, came were both uh, emigre designers uh, coming from Europe, and um, uh, so the, this new style was uh, was uh, just spread through exhibitions in uh, department stores and in uh, American museums. And uh, I would like to start from uh, the famous uh, exhibition at Macy's in 1928, where. Uh, um, the, uh, designers uh, um, from, um, uh, from uh, Germany, uh, Italy and France uh, displayed uh, furniture, uh, displayed interiors together with uh, um, American designers. And uh, <clears throat> this piece is a very rare piece by Bruno Paul, a German architect who displayed uh, in at Macy's. And the piece is now in the collection of the Wilsonian, uh, the, the Wilsonian in Genoa, one of the uh, few pieces from uh, uh, like outside Italy. And uh, what is interesting is to, um, to see the connection with uh, Cam Weber. Cam Weber was a, a, a student of Bruno Paul and he also exhibited uh, in uh, uh, in the same year at Macy's uh, with the room, uh, which was uh, combined uh, uh, com functionality and beauty. That's what uh, uh, the magazine Domus wrote about Cam Weber's interiors. Uh, this is a, a dressing table, which is part of a bedroom, uh, which was a uh, custom made, uh, and it's a uh, part of the Wilsonian. You can see um, like how uh, if, the, if the United States thought thought not to be modern enough how in the first uh, in a few years uh, like their style uh, became uh, uh, very modern and um, uh, using uh, elements that uh, characterize the american art deco like the skyscraper uh, the sky the stepped uh, uh, shape of the skyscraper can be found in the famous uh, uh, book uh, bookcase by theodor frankl which was also uh, custom made, but also was uh, sold uh, um, in his uh, store. So it was uh, not really mass produced, uh, but uh, um, was supposed uh, to be um, affordable. And uh, and you can see uh, the, um, uh, the the stepped uh, uh, shape also in uh, this uh, cocktail uh, uh, shaker and pitcher. Um, <clears throat> And the, again, the, the use of fluting surfaces comes back from Otto Stuber in Hamburg, who was also a, a student of Otto Pruncher, a Wiener Werkstatt architect. And again, in Walter von Nessen in this coffee service. Uh, but what I find uh, so interesting is this uh, uh, compact tea set, which is uh, uh, which was designed uh, by um, Virginia Hamill, uh, and she was invited to, uh, as many of these designers, uh, to beautify the objects and make them modern, so that uh, they could have been uh, they could have been uh, uh, sold more easily. So the idea of uh, uh, creating, uh, um, uh, creating them uh, and uh, or uh, revamping uh, the objects, uh, beautify them, and uh, to uh, to make them more appealing in the 1920s. Uh, well, in uh, the years when uh, we had uh, the depression, and it's also interesting to show uh, to uh, point out that Vict uh, Virginia Hamill, she was the designer, but uh, since she was a woman. Like traditionally, uh, the uh, Jan Theobald was the in-house designer, was always been uh, reported as the designer. Um, <clears throat> well, naturally, now I could show you uh, like uh, how the 
the evolution of uh, uh, the, the design in the United States like uh, became much more streamlined. Uh, it's like just uh, showing these two uh, toasters. Uh, this one uh, still shows like the geometry and uh, the um, the angularity and uh, the the um, stylization of the gazelle. While uh, uh, this uh, this other one uh, is is like represent uh, what uh, we call now streamline. And um, <clears throat> these two posters uh, celebrate uh, like the streamline, like this uh, uh, idea of uh, speed, which is given by uh, the shape of uh, the train of uh, trains, uh, um, cars uh, and uh, ocean liners uh, at the time. And uh, you can see how this was a model that uh, uh, was uh, typically American. This was uh, uh, the train designed by Henry Dreyfus, but uh, it was uh, like uh, uh, repeated in to uh, promote uh, a typewriter uh, by a Fr uh, French uh, uh, Belgian designer, Francis de la Delamar. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, designers who were uh, uh, like these interested designers could, design, uh, could, could create a, a train or a, a thermos, like this is the case of Henry Dreyfus who created uh, uh, this uh, thermos model uh, in uh, several colors with this idea of a mass produced or uh, of a mass produced object or a normal Bel Geddes who, who was uh, really like the um, was, was the one who uh, was the first one to promote uh, the idea of uh, streamlining uh, in uh, his book Horizon from 1932. And uh, he designed this uh, um, like seltzer bottle, uh, like the, the smooth shape, uh, um, like his streamlined shape. But also what is interesting is the fact that it was signed. So these uh, objects became uh, like even more interesting because they were uh, uh, like designed by an industrial designer. So uh, uh, the industrial designer started to become a kind of a star. And um, uh, Russell Wright was probably one of those, uh, of those designers who created uh, a, ser a service, a dinnerware service, uh, American modern, which became, uh, uh, which was mass produced and so successful that uh, was designed uh, for uh, uh, at least like uh, until the 1960s. And um, you still uh, can find it around because it was very popular. And um, uh, so I realized that it's, it's very late, but uh, um, so Donald Desky again uh, with his furniture, uh, which was uh, uh, again, could be custom made like in the case of uh, um, Radio City Music Hall, but also uh, could be sold in a department store like this uh, uh, beautiful suite, which was mounted in our uh, exhibition recently, uh, where you, you see like the horizontality, but also uh, the smooth uh, corners uh, of the, um, in the furniture. Uh, if you look at the details, uh, you see like how, uh, like the refined, uh, uh, simple lines uh, that uh, were uh, um, thought to be produced, uh, easily produced, uh, where like the precious, uh, um, uh, the precious decorative side came from the quality of the wood. And uh, uh, I would uh, end up with the radio because uh, the radio was uh, like a very competitive field for designers at the time. Um, the uh, Walter Teague created uh, this uh, typical, uh, uh, his typical signature was this mirrored, glass mirrored surface uh, for uh, his uh, streamlined radios. Um, <clears throat> but uh, uh, probably the most uh, interesting uh, um, designer was uh, John Vassos, a Greek emigre who was the uh, artistic director for uh, RCA for uh, uh, 30 years. He created the famous portable uh, um, uh, phonograph and uh, uh, a series of radios. As he said, uh, he wanted to, uh, he was determined to create uh, um, a new form to replace uh, the monstrosi monstrosities that we now suffer from known as uh, radio cabinets. Naturally, he was uh, um, referring to those uh, uh, cabinets which, which, uh, uh, where the radio was uh, uh, hidden inside. 
and uh, he uh, even designed uh, the first uh, television which premiered at the uh, New York World's Fair in 1939 and uh, <clears throat> it will it will uh, be become uh, a mass uh, uh, product in um, in later years but at the time uh, because of the war like not uh, not many uh, pieces were sold and still even after the war uh, you you could see the advertisements uh, of people uh, uh, watching uh, uh, television as an event uh, wearing gowns uh, so um, it was uh, designed for the masses but uh, it will be uh, become a mass product just uh, uh, later in the 1970s uh, 60s um, uh, thank you for your attention and i'm sorry that uh, i I talk too much, probably. Uh, no, you talk just the right amount. <laughs> um, thank uh, you, Sylvia. That, that was really, really a feast. And um, I imagine you have not been looking at the chat section while you're talking, but there were lots of woos and ahs in the chat section over many of the, the things that you showed us. I think we do have a few minutes for some questions and answers. We've gotten a couple in the Q&A section. Um, if anyone in the audience would like to add a question or two, please do. I, I just uh, want to start with a, a couple of questions asked by Anonymous um, having to do with um, sort of symbolism, uh, um, in particular about the gazelle and the frozen fountain. Uh, if you could say something about what those uh, motifs were meant to represent. Uh, well, the gazelle is just uh, represent the interest for uh, like uh, exotic culture. So the the gazelle is a, a an animal which is not typical of uh, like the let's say Western uh, um, culture. So it was uh, a, as a um, as a motif is uh, like a an interpretation of uh, an exotic. Uh, um, animal which comes back and uh, as uh, is reinterpreted uh, in more uh, like figurative ways or more stylized ways, uh, but it's uh, very much uh, present. Why the the frozen fountain is uh, is very interesting because it's a like this uh, geometric uh, element uh, um, that uh, comes uh, very um, very often, uh, starting from. Uh, uh, Lalique in uh, Paris in 1925 and um, so it becomes a, a um, it just the, the the definition frozen fountain um, is just a typical of Art Deco and uh, it it returns uh, very often because it's just this idea of uh, stylizing uh, a natural element so it's the stylization of water in a way and uh, you have the symmetry um, of the, uh, what do you say, the the fall of the of the water. Like it's a, it's a very interesting element that, for example, you see in the Wilsonian in uh, um, in our lobby. Uh, this element of the fountain has been uh, transformed in a real uh, fountain by the architect Mark Hampton when. Uh, he installed uh, like the the museum, uh, but it's usually a sometimes it's also a kind of a feast of water uh, of frozen water and uh, flowers. Uh, another question, and this is actually from Victoria Pass, but it's a question that I um, asked in my head as you were talking. Uh, if you could say something more about the self-service table, the autarky table. Oh uh, yes. And I got the impression, and this is what Victoria asked also, was the idea that during the fascist period, you wouldn't want a private conversation overheard mm. and therefore you would want um, not to have servants around while yeah. you were dining or was it just more about the availability of domestic servants maybe? No, 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 it was more like the idea was to have, uh, well, because uh, uh, like many anti-fascists, so they, uh, they didn't want to have um, like uh, anybody uh, overhearing uh, their uh, uh, conversations uh, at the table. So I think it was a very 
uh, interesting idea and uh, <clears throat> but just one was produced as far as we know because uh, he got the, like the copyright in 1935 and um, and this was donated to us when, uh, like, uh, from, it was uh, two ladies, friends of Mickey, who, saw, who thought, oh, our, uh, uh, I think it was their great uh, uncle who designed it. And uh, so it was uh, restored and uh, we had, uh, like, they kept everything that was used at the time. Another question from Christina Matin. And one that I've also wondered about myself, I don't know whether you'll be able to answer this, but I'm mm. curious, uh, what did people watch on TV in 1939? Uh, <clears throat> oh, oh, that's um, 1939. I mean, I suppose that they could watch also movies. Yeah, I was wondering maybe if, say, if um, there was a presidential speech. Yes. Or, you know, like a, a presidential convention or a boxing match or something else. Yusuf um, chimed in to say there weren't that many programs in 1939. And I'm, I'm sure that's true. That that piece yeah. also has a shortwave radio. So people would have used it at least as much for radio broadcasts as for television at that time, I believe. Sure, but anyway, it was, uh, they kept them in uh, storage during the war and they started to sell them after the war. So. Uh, also, probably the broadcasting became uh, better. And the yeah, if you look at in the chat sections, people are contributing various um, uh, pieces of information about that. For instance, the coronation in, in Britain was broadcast on television. Oh, okay, uh, nice. So, see them. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, I think your talk really kind of demonstrated that Art Deco is more than one thing from the most ornate to the most stripped down um, mm. and was really a wonderful overview. Thank you. And thank you um, for everyone who joined us. Please keep in mind that there, uh, speaking of feasts, there's a whole feast of Art Deco programming. Um, now through Sunday, um, please um, look at MDPL's website, artdeco.com, for a complete calendar. And you can also go to the Wolfsonian's website um, to our What's On page for the house tours on Saturday and Sunday. So I hope you'll be joining us for uh, many of those events. And thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, thanks again, Sylvia. Right, thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>